Hey, you behave down there, Resnick. Hey, Dr. <laughs> Miss Lily. We're a little uh, little snowy and very cold. It's really snowy up here in Beckley. Oh, I bet. And quite chilly. <laughs> There I am. <laughs> Do I have anybody in class today? Yeah. Yeah. I think you got a couple of victims up here with cameras pointing that way. Oh. Hold on. I'll, I'll change it so you can see us. That'd be great. How about that? Hey, uh, hey, that's better now if you just drop that back shade because all I can see is shadows. I hear you. <laughs> And I like to be able to have faces. How many people we got in there? Six today or five? Five. Thank you. Who's next? Lily, Lily counts as six. Julia. She's not there again today. No. I I'm gonna send myself a message and send her an email. I'm concerned. All right. So I'm getting ready to review test number two today. Julie was here in our last class. Say again. Julia was here for our last class. I didn't see you week two class. I'm too she was here. I need two classes Cause she struggled last night, didn't she? No, that was Kelsey. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, now, has Miss uh, Adam brought you all your test test number two to review? Did she give them back to you? Yes. Yeah, we have it. All right. I'm going to hand them out right here in class uh, here in just a second. Let me get them handed out, and we're going to review them real quick before we jump into the notes for the day. Center. He was uh, over, and every time I see that name, I look right here. Age or just the first page? Uh, his name was Michael Ayers. There's me and Brett. Nice guy, but he wore a beard all the time. He, he was a little shorter than you. Kind of chubby, uh, wore a beard all the time. Uh, good, good counselor. Okay. All right, let's go through these. Uh, I want to throw some of these out to you all. Some of you struggled. Some of these questions were not intended to be as difficult as they turned out to be. I'm going to attribute. I had your test. I don't know where I'd put it. I don't think. Did you take a makeup test? You didn't? No. Okay. I think this is all we can come. Yeah, no, hope will be 
Right in the middle of the day. Some people's kids. What, that coffee? Or did she get a new coffee? All right, thank you. Okay. Well, wait a second, that's what I want to keep her around. Yeah, I'm just like, I'm still working on it. All right. Thank you, Mr. Lilly. Thank you. And I'll be back yep. this way in about. Uh, Won't you just start doing Thursday? Thursday. No. Yeah, and then give you two minutes on that one, just whenever we can. It's pretty hard. Yeah. So. Oh, so I didn't mean for it to be as difficult as it turned out to be. Here we go. The deciding factor between cyber crime and cyber terrorism is. B, whether it was done for profit or gain. Not the amount of damage, but whether or not it was done for profit or gain. The, the, the next question to that is on over in the test when it, when it asks you, uh, cyber terrorism <coughs> is based on ideology, not money. Remember that question? We'll get to it in a minute. Number two, which item on the list below does NCIC not maintain for criminal justice agency to, agencies to access? Is it, it, the answer to that was C, fingerprints. Fingerprints are not on NCIC. They're on CODIS. Number three, CompStat's computer crime analysis program that becomes pop, became popular for being used successfully in what city? D, New York. Four, drones must be registered with one agency if they're over a particular weight. We talked about this two or three different days, but this question still gave people a lot of trouble. I suppose it's because one of my answers was FHA. FHA was the group in school, or Future Homemakers of America, or it's Federal Housing Authority. The group we were looking at is FAA. All right, so the answer is B. For number four, it's B. Number five. Private companies spend approximately blank each year to combat cybercrime. The answer was $60 billion. I did go over that. We didn't spend a lot of time on it, but I did go over it. Number six, cybercrime is a traditional real-world offense in A, C, digital version. Number seven, CompStat. I, my my autocorrect got me on this one. It should have said CompStat is a spatial crime prevention program that uses data from many sources to create crime patterns. That answer is true. Most everybody got it right. It is true. What act made data collection easier for the police? I have been pounding this in all of my classes for weeks and weeks and weeks. The answer is A, the Patriot Act. Data mining is basically defined as gathering large amounts of data and transforming it into understandable information. That is true. A, true. Ten, robots like the ones used in San Bernardino are utilized to make police work. B, safer. B, safer. The reason it's not all of the above is being more complex is not an advantage of a robot. It might be a disadvantage, but it's not an advantage. Eleven, body cameras are new technology that provides police with video documentation of encounters it has between police officers and citizens. That is A, true. What event created change and encouraged police to embrace a more active, uh, to embrace more active utilization of technology in the criminal justice field? All of those may have had something to do with it, but the one event that caused the criminal justice system to pivot on using technology and police work was A, the terrorist acts of 9-11. Criminal histories that are stored in NCIC are B, maintained permanently. 14, the public's been very critical of data mining. What U.S. constitutional amendment does the public assert is being violated through the use of data mining? C, the Fourth Amendment. Remember, the Fourth Amendment covers arrest and search and seizure. 15, cyber terrorism is motivated by ideology and not financial gain. That is true. That is, the, that is the counterpart to the question on the other side about the defining what makes something a, a cyber crime and not an act of terrorism. It's financial gain. 
And if it's terrorism, it's ideology. 16. What department of the U.S. government is responsible for cybercrime investigations? This gave people fits, and I did not think about it because we covered it, I thought, pretty good. The answer is B, the Department of Homeland Security. The Department of Homeland Security. 17. What agency within the above referenced uh, department is assigned cybercrime investigations? That answer again is D, the Secret Service. Secret Service was given that assignment. 18, star chase pursuit, e-tickets, gunshot direction system, and drones are all examples, examples of technology and policing. That is true. NCIC stands for the National Crime Information and Communications. Is that true? It is false. What does NCIC stand for? I've had that all National Say again. Yes, it's on the last word. It's center, not communications. National Crime Information Center. 21. Fugitives and wanted individuals are always entered in the NCIC. That is true. What about 20? Oh, did I skip 20? I'm sorry. What federal agency oversees NCIC? It is A, the FBI. 21. Fugitives and wanted individuals are always entered in NCIC. That is true. 22. The general public has limited access to information listed on NCIC. That is false. The general public has no access to information on NCIC. Not limited, they have none. 23. Cybercrime requires two areas to be investigated. First, the actual or physical location, and second is the B, digital location. 24. The federal government has an official plan for combating cybercrime. According to our notes, that answer is B, false. 25. Cybercrime involves a computer and a network. network. Great. The bonus question. The bonus question was extremely hard. Uh, I didn't give credit, but this to a couple of people. The bonus question answer, the three steps was to organize, train, and equip. Organize, train, and equip. Any questions? I, again, I don't think as a class our grades were what they typically are. They weren't what our first test was. They weren't terrible, but they weren't hardly as good as our first test. I'm going to attribute that to the fact that we had a ton of snow, we missed a bunch of days. My folks in Beckley had a lot of trouble getting there on a couple of days, and I just had a couple of people. And then they stepped in like troopers and took that test so they wouldn't have to make it up. I, I'm not freaking out about this test. Uh, I have the review for the test we're going to take on Tuesday right here. We're going to go over it before we go home just to make sure we're back on track. Uh, but I think everybody's in pretty good shape. Did I mark on your phone? Yeah, I do want them back. I do. I want them back to keep them. I'm going to go around and pass those up. Uh, Bestly, I do not want yours back. I have a copy of yours on my computer, so you can keep yours. I'm going to put this test away. I'm going to get my notes out. We'll jump right into things. Oh, I'm glad you reminded me of that. Forgot. All right, let's go to work three. Go ahead. Thank you for that. Remember, I, I get into what I'm supposed to do, and I forget to do that. I would go home. All right. So we've talked about intelligence-led policing, and I've, we've, we've kind of hammered home, and I've, I've listed for you the uh, 
steps there are in a good intelligence-led policing organization. And I've listed for you the, the four levels of, of intelligence-led policing departments, how they've divided up into four levels. And then we looked at that research study and we talked about the 10 things that they learned from that research study. So we've talked about all of those things and we've covered all that information in intelligence-led policing. And so now what I want to do is back up a little bit and I want to close out today talking to you about where intelligence-led policing comes from. So I wanted to kind of put the cart in front of the horse. It's hard to talk about where something comes from when you don't understand exactly what it is. So we've covered what it is, we've covered what it does, we've covered how it affects how we collect information and, and why we do what we do. And we discovered that the terrorist attacks of 9-11 really caused crime to become worldwide and it caused us to really pivot in how we're going to work on our police work. But where this originated, where this whole thing originated, uh, our intelligence-led policing, is a little place called uh, Kent, England. Kent, England, K-E-N-T, Kent, England. And it was originally, before it was known as the intelligence-led policing model, it was known as the Kent policing model. transformed when it crossed over the Atlantic Ocean from the Kent policing model to the intelligence-led policing model. I guess somebody in America didn't want to give the people in Kent credit for doing what they did, right? But that's kind of, Kent's kind of where it all got started. And here's how it all got started. The law enforcement in Kent, England, saw a spike in property crime over a, a period of time in their history. I don't remember if it was 12 months or 24 months. But property crime really went up. And they decided they were going to have to take some action. They were going to have to get a control on it because the property crime had just kind of grew out of control. Property crime was, was, was really their number one issue. And so um, they began to prioritize their police calls um, and calls for service. And they focused in on their property crimes and the other crimes and the other calls for service sort of got shuffled down the line, okay? So if they got more calls in, in, a, in a four hour period than they had officers to answer them, those calls that were not property crimes, that were not violent crimes, kind of got shuffled down the list and they were focusing on their property crimes, right? And uh, they made uh, gathering intelligence on those property crimes to top priority. And they also moved having those property crimes being, uh, and I talked about this in my 8 o'clock class, if y'all were in the 8 o'clock class, forgive me, you're going to hear it again, but if they had 10 property crimes, they weren't 10 separate incidences, okay? That's what we tend to do in American policing. If you have a, a, a breaking and entering over here, that he answers, and you have a breaking and entering over there that she answers, and then you got another breaking and entering across town that she answers and takes the report on, and then there's one that I take the report on. Those are five or six different incidences, right? And they're all their own <coughs> incidents. Well, they stopped looking at them like that. They started looking at all of the breaking and enterings. They lumped them together, and we're looking at them as one large problem instead of eight or nine different incidences, okay? So they began to, to put things together and look at them as a group. The result of their concentrated effort over a 24-month time period, excuse me, over a three-year time period, was a 25% drop in crime, property crime. Their property crime went from exploding to within three years, they had a 25% drop. Now, I know that doesn't seem like a whole lot, but in police terms, that's several thousand incidences, right? So the word intelligence-led policing really came from this Kent model because the Kent model focused on the key criminal activities. Make sense? The Kent model focused on the key criminal activities. It focused on the ability to confront crime 
in its active form. And then they would build on each success. They could confront crime in its active form and then build on each success. Every time they made a bust, they gained data from that arrest and it built. Now, the Kent model of policing in England had a, had a, um, a latent effect, if you will, had, a, had an unknown effect on their policing. Because their police officers were constantly gathering data, because their police officers were constantly gathering intel, because they were constantly bringing in that information, they suddenly realized that their police officers were their best defense against terrorist activities going on in England. And so it began to spread outside of Kent. Because those police officers are constantly gathering that data, not only do they become more effective with local crime, but they also begin to be your primary resource for gathering intel on um, terrorist activities. One of the best examples of intelligence-led policing successes in the last little bit that I can think of is the intelligence-led policing that led to the arrest of the terrorist uh, cell that was getting ready to have another shooting rampage in France. Do you all remember them? They arrested part of them in France and part of them in Amsterdam. You remember that? Uh, they had put together a whole cache of weapons and they were going to go on another shooting rampage inside of France. And they, the intelligence-led policing networked those folks together and made the arrest in France and in Amsterdam before they got to, to uh, uh, execute their plan. And that was all done off of police intel. None of it was international data. It was all local police right there on the scene put that together and then worked with the folks in Amsterdam and was able to arrest everybody in that cell. In fact, I think they got them all but one. They ended up having to kill the last one, right? The guy that had the guy that had the, uh, the ties to actual ISIS, uh, he held up in his room, and I think they had to kill him. They couldn't get him out. They had to shoot him, get him out of there. But they got everybody else. So, um, there are a couple of spinoffs that come off of intelligence-led policing. I don't want to say spinoff. Spinoff's not the right word. Scratch that. I, don't, I didn't want to use the word spinoff. There are a couple of um, programs that came off of intelligence-led policing that are different in their makeup but are also a form of intelligence-led policing. One of those is problem-oriented policing. Now, problem-oriented policing is not as popular as intelligence-led policing. Problem-oriented policing tends to um, focus less on gathering data and more on solving a problem, right? So, in other words, it kind of mirrors what they did in Kent. Kent had a particular problem. That problem was property crime. They zeroed in on that property crime. They zeroed in. They made a bullseye on that property crime, right? They just zeroed in on it, and that's what they focused on for a period of time. That was their problem. And so they created all kinds of different um, possibilities and opportunities to solve that problem. So that was your problem-oriented police, and that's problem-oriented policing. Problem-oriented policing was, the, was kind of coined and introduced by a man named Herman Goldstein. Herman Goldstein. He's going to be on your 8 o'clock test as well. Remember that? Herman Goldstein. So he's going to be on, he, he may or may not be on this test. But he's definitely going to be on the 8 o'clock test. Herman Goldstein said, uh, problem-oriented policing requires assessing each problem and developing a tailored response. And that's really what problem-oriented policing is all the way. Are you okay? Uh, problem-oriented policing. It requires... Assessing each little problem and developing a tailored response. That's problem-oriented policing in its um, in, in its most raw form. Remember, what you're doing is you're moving out all of the other 
crimes, they become less important and you kind of shuffle them down and you're like a laser beam, you just really focus in on that one problem. <coughs> I'm sorry. Um, it requires uh, assessing each new problem and developing a tailored response. Developing a tailored response. That last name, that was Goldstein? Goldstein. Um, here's the part that makes police um, problem-oriented policing and intelligence-led policing so very effective. And that is, is that after you tailor that response, you look at your response for its effectiveness, and then you adjust, right? And that's the scientific part of intelligence-led policing. That's the scientific part of problem-oriented policing. That's where you know that you really are making a difference, all right? Because what you do is you look at your result. You set a goal. You identify the problem, you set the goal, you take action on that goal, and then you look to see how effective you were. And if you weren't as effective as you want to be, you tweak that until you get the effectiveness you want to get until you meet your goal, right? And that constant evaluating of outcomes makes this a scientific process. It also makes you more effective. Now, the last one that I want to talk to you about, and then we'll... We'll talk about, um, well, i got a couple of little things, and then we'll, I will uh, tell you about the, what writing assignment I want you to do for this weekend, and then we'll stay for the test. The last one I'll talk to you about is SARA, acronym of SARA. Again, what we talked about in this morning's class, so y'all are getting it twice, but the, some of, not everybody was in there, so y'all just have to get it twice. <clears throat> SARA stands for Scanning, Analyzing, Responding, and Assessing. Scanning, analyzing, responding, and assessing. Sarah is considered to be kind of a synonym for problem-oriented policing. They're kind of interchangeable. The difference between problem-oriented policing and Sarah is that problem-oriented policing tends to bring things down into a laser beam and to a bright focus. And Sarah is more like problem or, uh, more like intelligence-led policing in that it is very broad. It can be very broad, okay? So problem-oriented policing brings it down into a focus, and Sarah is probably a little more broad, along with intelligence-led policing. They can be a little more broad in their focus. Sarah also uh, applies and focuses on trying to gather data. Problem-oriented policing, not so much. Sarah is always trying to gather data and intel. There are certain partners in any type of intelligence-led policing, whether it's problem-oriented policing, uh, Sarah, intelligence-led policing, whatever it is, you have a certain partners. You have certain partners. And one of the biggest partners you've got in that is your community, the people you are serving and protecting, the public. So intelligence-led policing, knowing that we have to have a partner in this intelligence-led policing and that is the public that we are working with, what oftentimes goes hand in hand with intelligence-led policing, knowing that we've got to go work well with the public? Proactive policing, but there's another word for it, and you're right on the money. Well, what's the word? What's the word we use? Community policing, that's the word we use. That's our little catch word, but you're right, it is proactive policing. It's, it's getting involved with the community, it's being involved with the community. So what you need to know how all this ties together is an intelligence-led policing department, a problem-oriented policing department is also going to adopt your community policing model or your proactive model because that's how you make them work together. That's how you get the data, the intel that you need to get, and that is your partner. So know that all of those, those theories that we talk about, community policing and all of those, they all have a fit. 
Does that fit create its purpose? Questions so far? Know that one of the big focuses is uh, that I've tried to make point that the Kent model brought out and that we've brought into this country that may or may not be um, I may or may not have expressed as plainly as I wanted to is that local police officers have been brought into the terrorism fight. Local police officers make a difference. The local police officers in San Bernardino, they make a difference. Local police officers in New York, local police officers in Boston, they made a difference. You know, we didn't, we didn't prevent that terrorist attack, but we were on top of it, and we made arrests pretty quick after it happened. Your local law enforcement officers are going to be involved. Now, I've got an erotic, a writing assignment for you. This one's a little different for the weekend. I'd like you to turn it in on Tuesday. This one's a little different from anything I've asked you to do before. This is going to be a little more comprehensive. So here we go. Here's the background for your writing assignment. You are the chief of police in small town West Virginia. You are the chief of police in small town West Virginia. In the last year, in the last 12 months, you have had over a thousand vending machine thefts. You have had over 1,000 incidents of, in, of vending machine theft. Totaling over $100,000 in total loss. Over $100,000. Over $100, Did I say $1,000? I'm sorry. Over $100,000 in total loss. Give me just a second. Will you will you run down there and tell them that we need to have an increase in diabetes? <laughs> 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 and whoever is twenty some kind of And we I'll get you caught up on the writing assignment in a minute. She's standing out there with her. All right. 26-year-old. Um, all right, I'm going to start again because I, I lost my place. All right, here we go. You're the police chief in small town West Virginia. In the last year, you have had over 1,000 incidents of vending machine theft, totaling more than $100,000 in total damage, in total loss. Okay? Using... The intelligence-led policing model, or you can use the pro uh, the, the uh, uh, problem-oriented policing model, either one, but I would prefer intelligence-led policing model. Tell me, as the chief, how you would address this problem. Yes. I will. I'll repeat it again. Can you all hear me good? And, Beckley, you get what I'm telling you? Yes. Yes, sir. Yes. All right, good. I worry about these speakers, but the mics seem to be a lot better now, right? A little bit. All right. You are the police chief in small town West Virginia. In the last year, you had over 1,000 incidents of uh, vending machine theft, totaling over $100,000 in loss. Using the intelligence-led policing model, Tell me how you would address this problem. This is not going to be quite as easy a writing assignment as I've given you in the past. This may be a little more involved, right? But this gives me an opportunity to look and see how 
your understanding of intelligence-led policing is going to fit. Questions about the writing assignment? I'm excited about reading those. I think it's going to be good stuff. Remember, we're th in this class, we're thinking outside the box. We're not solve solving problems traditionally. We are thinking outside the box. I, I, I don't want you to look at this like the chief of police of uh, you know, Charleston would have looked at it 30 years ago. I want you to look at it like you're the chief of police and you're going to solve a problem today and use our intelligence-led policing model. Questions about the writing assignment? Okay, nurse there. Good. Any questions about the writing assignment? Any questions about anything we've covered to this point? Because I'm getting ready to jump into review for the test. Uh, actually, we have a I do not have a minimum length, but I promise uh, oh, a few things. One, you won't be able to get this done much less than a page, I wouldn't think. I think it's going to cover, a, you know, about a page type. Um, I, but I'm not going to give you a minimum length. Um, you can wrap it up as quickly as you want to wrap it up. I'm, I'm more interested in substance than I am fluff. You know, you can write me a five-page paper, and if it's all fluff, it does me no good. I want substance, right? Um Second thing is, if you use a source, and you may very well want to use a source in this little writing, please cite it, APA style, cite it, okay? Let's not get into any plagiarism concerns while we're writing these. Cite your source. It's okay if you use a source, but cite it. And use the APA style to cite it. Uh, and again, I'm not going to give you a minimum link. I'm more concerned with you knowing the material and understanding it and putting it into a usable form than I am three or four pages of fluff. I want to know that you know it, and that's what I'm. That's what my concern is, right? And if you if you write if you write this the way it ought to be written, it ought to be obvious to me that you know it. Uh, Mr. Ayers, are you are you sending that to Mr. Lee? I am. That's great. I was going to email him after a while, but if you're sending that to him, I won't. Okay. Great. Uh, I was going to try to email him a little bit, but you sending it to him is even better. That's wonderful because he's. He is a stickler about being on time with his assignments. I, I appreciate him. I really do. Uh, all right, here we go. Review for the test. Y'all ready? Yes. Yeah. Wow, Mr. Brewer, you freak me out. Yes. You get that focused look and I'm gone. <laughs> <laughs> oh. um, all right. What is tactical intelligence? Speak once. Focus on the short-term goal. Right. All right. Um, tactical intelligence is is focused on um, a certain goal, and it's it is about um, planning and and manpower. Right. Tactical is about planning and manpower. What is um, Strategy intelligence, strategic intelligence, long term. Excuse me, I gave you the wrong answer. Tactical intelligence, like he said, is about a, a um, short term goal. It's about information on a specific investigation, right? Information on a specific investigation. That's tactical, yes. I do want to correct that. I was reading the wrong thing. Yeah. Strategic intelligence is about planning and manpower and long term, right? Number three, information plus data plus analysis equals intelligence. That's right. Can you say that again? Uh, yes. Information plus data plus analysis equals intelligence. Intel is given to decision makers in a department to help with what? Absolutely, thank you. To make informed decisions. Intel, intelligence can come from all but which one of the following sources? FBI, Citizens Complaints, Comstat, or the Inquirer? The Inquirer. Why not? Why is it not considered news media? Fat boy and like that, They're gossip, right? It's a gossip. Number six. 
Um, I gave, the notes I gave you list six steps of intelligence in lead policing. Which one of the following is not one of those six steps? Plan how data will be collected, process data for review, synthesize data into groups, or analysis, derive meaning? Synthesize data. Good, synthesize data into groups, good. Uh, I'll read the question again. Your notes list six steps to intelligence-led policing. Which one of the following is not on that list? Plan how data will be collected, process data for review, synthesize data into groups, or analyze data by deriving meaning. The answer is synthesizing, good. Data collection is not very difficult, can be done cheaply, does not take very much manpower, is very labor intensive. It is very labor intensive, good. There are how many levels of operations in intelligence-led policing? Remember, I gave those to you all. There are four. Four. Uh, four. Uh, yeah, four levels. Those four levels, uh, the highest one is level one, and that is a model of intel policing, right? That is the model of intelligence-led policing. What's number four? Silo. Silo. Like a silo. Somebody who doesn't do anything. To be effective, intelligence-led policing requires data, analysis, command commitment, or none of the above. Yes. To be effective in intelligence-led policing, uh, intelligence-led policing requires data, analysis, command commitment, or none of the above. Where is that at? Command commitment. Remember, we talked about that and uh, on Tuesday. The one of the study, one of the results that come out of that study was intelligence-led policing cannot be successful without command commitment. If the sheriff, if the chief, if the administrative staff are not behind you 110%, intelligence-led policing will not work. It crumbles, breaks down. I'm sorry, can you repeat that question one more time there? Sure. To be effective, intelligence-led policing requires data, an analyst, command commitment, or none of the above. Shouldn't there have been all of the above? Because doesn't it require data and analysis as well? Yes, but I didn't. I didn't want to. I didn't want all of the above. I didn't want that to be one of the options. So, in that case, pick the most relevant. That's right. Okay. Number eleven. According to your notes, problem clarity in intelligence-led policing means what? Can't, the problem can't be fixed until they actually have a clear, concise idea of the problem? Great. Excellent answer. What she said was problem clarity means that the problem can't be fixed until we have a clear, concise idea of what the problem is. <laughs> the level of success in intelligence... Um, yeah, this, it does me good to go over these questions to make sure I wrote them right. <laughs> to achieve a level of success in intelligence-led policing, uh, we should um, be effective at verifying data. Our level of success is related to cooperation with partnering agencies, is based on hiring good analysts, or none of the above. Here again, we're on those 10 things we learned from that study. What was it we said about collaboration? collaboration. Excellent. The key to our success is collaboration. It is good to have be able to verify the data. It is good to have a good analyst, but the key is collaboration because we only may have a piece of information. You with me? The other agencies may have the rest of the information we need to be successful. 
Information collection is a continuous process, true or false? True. Say again? Information true. collection is a continuous process, true or false? True. It's true. Uh, Intelligence-led policing cannot exist without dedicated intel collection effort. True or false? It is true. Holistic investigations are a new idea born from intelligence-led policing. True or false? True. Uh, what was the question again? Holistic investigations are a new idea born from intelligence-led policing. Who said true? She said true. Correct. It is true. Remember we talked about holistic investigations? <laughs> Intelligence-led policing stressed officer accountability throughout the intelligence process. True or false? True. Repeat that. Intelligence-led policing stressed officer accountability throughout the intelligence process. True or false? Shooting arrow? Okay, good. Okay. You with me? Yes. Intelligence? Uh, intelligence policing stressed officer accountability throughout the intelligence pro uh, policing process. That is true. <laughs> 18. Officers surveyed by intelligence-led policing say that accountability has done what? Got them fired, not had any impact, made the morale low, or improved morale and job satisfaction? The last one, improved morale and job satisfaction. Why did it do that? They felt it was a fair work environment. They could see the results of their effort, right? They could see their accomplishment. Made them feel like they were being effective. The final step in intelligence-led policing is evaluation, evaluation, evaluation. Actually, the word that I'm going to use on this test is assessment. So instead of evaluation, know that the final step is assessment. Continuous assessment helps to counteract what? The law of diminishing returns. Very good. It helps to counteract the law of diminishing returns. The constant assessment makes intelligence-led policing a scientific program. True or false? True. That is very true. Information disseminated from one agency to other agencies should be managed by those who need to see it and those who request to see it. True or false? False. False. Why is it false? Good. Requested is not one of those, right? Requested is not one of those. They have to be authorized. Uh, the Kent model of policing was first practiced in England uh, in response to a sharp increase in property crime. True or false? True. True. The Kent model formed a specific effort on, cre on key contributor... Yeah, wait a minute, let me read that again. That was awful. The Kent model focused effort on key criminal activities and money trails. True or false? False. What well, would that be false? Good. Problem-oriented policing and Sarah are both different forms of intelligence-led policing. True or false? True. That is true. If I were to ask you all 
close your books and tell me the 10 lessons learned from the report from the study. Could you all close your books and give me 10 of them? All together, could you close them and give me 10 of them as a group? Could you give me 10? All right. That's the review for the test. Does anybody have anything they'd like to add? Any questions before we take the test on Tuesday? Please write your papers for me over the weekend. Have them ready to turn in. If you all would, you can send them to me evidently by email on Tuesday. Um, remember, no plagiarism. If you find, if you use a source, write it. I'm not interested in fluff. I want to know that you know what we're talking about. I want to know that you've mastered your material. And this writing assignment gives you an opportunity to do that. More content than this one. I would think at a minimum it took you a page. You know, and maybe you can get done a little quicker, but better for those of you uh, who want to go more in depth, please feel free to go more in depth in your grade. Uh, Y'all have a good weekend. Anybody got any tests? Any questions about the test? No, we're good up here. All right, I got a question right here. Uh, did you? No, I didn't get any ears. Yes. Any other questions? Have a good weekend. I'll see you all on Tuesday. Hopefully the weather will be back. What's your advice on? One through three. Number one is uh, what is uh, tactical intelligence? Number two, what is strategic intelligence? Number three is information plus data plus analysis, analysis equals... Information plus data plus analysis equals? I guess I got two questions in there, but yeah. I don't know how I missed that one. That's over here. I'm sorry about that. You don't call address to me, you're sick. It's all right, we got you. Look, yeah, I'll give you 10 bonus points just for that bother. Are you like the students? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you want me to just go over the office? Um, what time do you want to do this now? Yeah, I'm, you ready? I'm done now. Yeah. So, um, I've got a I've got a meeting that I have to go to a little bit. Can I put you in that room next to me and give you the test and just let the slide money go over the day? Yeah. Is that okay? With you? That's fine. You don't mind if I don't wait on you? Yeah. Okay. You're okay. Yeah. I, I, look, dude. If you were going to cheat, you'd have done cheated. I trust you not to cheat. <coughs> All right. It's not. It's not going to do it. All right. Thank you. I've got, I've sent an email to her and Miss Ridley knows and she's going over to turn the notes in, okay? Um, what will we do next Monday? We're going to have a test and then I'm going to try to cover some more lecture. One and two. Yeah. I will have to make that up because I have to go. Okay. All right. No, no worries. We'll make it up. I mean, you're 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 when you're acing everything you're doing, you're making really good grades for me. I don't have any concerns. Um, you're reading the chapters and you're knowing your material, so you're not gonna have and going over your PowerPoints. Obviously, I mean, it's obvious to me because when I see your test grades, it's, you know, it's obvious that you're putting in the work. So I don't, I'm not concerned about you missing and making it up. That won't be a problem. The biggest thing is just finding time for you to come and make it up. Okay. But we'll work on it. No worries. Just be careful. Have a good weekend. Okay. Oh, yeah, man. Still want me to meet you at your office at one? I do. At one today? Yeah, you should. Um, let's meet. I've got. A, I've, I've had a meeting that comes up that I've got to go to today. Let's meet at. Um, are you here Monday? Are you here Monday? Are you here Tuesday? You're here Tuesday. How early? So why don't you? That class is over at ten. I have two classes at one thirty. Yeah, it's, it's a problem. Um, it's why don't you with my other classes too? Cause I have to stay to both them at the same time. Right. Won't you come to my office tomorrow? I mean Monday at uh, when you Monday. get out of that class. Tuesday. Uh -huh. And let's review for this test right before you take it. In your office. Yep. And let's go over the material just before you take the test. Okay.
Thank you. Because I want to make sure we know it. Okay? Okay. All right. Um, come to my office. You wait on it. Yeah, right after class, right after the 8 o'clock class. Okay. And let's meet in your review for this one. Okay. That way it'll be fresh for you to come in here and take it. Okay. All right? Um, why is she trying to go to the hospital? She'll Thank you. 